Our next presentation is Financial Technology as a Key Ingredient to Support the Omnichannel Shopper Journey. Our speakers are Kerry Hawkins and Jason Murray of Inmar Intelligence. Kerry, the podium is yours. Thank you, John. Hello, hello, and thank you for joining us. We're excited to talk to you guys today about a topic that has been top of mind for us here at Inmar and for our clients as well, and that is channel convergence and the hybridization of the shopper journey. Jason, thanks for joining me today. Yeah, it's great to be here. Uh, today we're going to look at what the modern shopper journey looks like and how retailers and CPGs uh, leverage financial technology to drive growth. Uh, before we do that, uh, just some, some brief introductions. Um, if, if you don't know about Enmar, uh, Enmar is an applied data platform company. Uh, we facilitate commerce for well over 15,000 customers, and that includes retailers and CPGs and pharmacies and hospitals and government services. Uh, to help them be more successful with their uh, patients uh, or with their customers. Uh, I have been at Inmar for uh, almost 15 years now in, in, in various uh, leadership roles. My current role is uh, I'm the Director of Client Development for our financial technology uh, solutions, and um, I'm happy to, uh, happy to be here today. Hey, guys. Thanks, Jason. Uh, my name is Carrie Hawkins. I'm the Business Development Director over in Mars FinTech Solutions. That includes things like coupon and rebate settlement, deductions management, um, and we are very excited to dive into payments today and talk about, you know, how those can be a part of your engagement strategy. Um, and I think some of this is going to be fun. It may not sound like payments is something that you could get excited about, but we are and hope you will be as well. So let's go ahead and dive in. Um, before we can start talking about growth strategies and how financial technology plays a role in executing against those strategies, we first need to understand the lay of the land. What's happening? Um, it's no secret that the shopper journey has evolved in recent years. Um, and although it was evolving pre-2020, the pandemic has accelerated changes that were already in motion, as well as drove new and unanticipated changes. Jason, let's take a look at how shopping has changed. Yeah, so one of the largest trends uh, that we've noticed is this increase in hybrid shopping. You know, ev everybody's doing their part. You try to avoid, you know, in-close, in-person interactions with people. You know, people are limiting their in-store purchases, shopping online. Um, and, and Enmar actually did a, a Shopper Insights study uh, in 2020, and, and you can see the statistics there. Uh, you know, 42% is a huge number uh, of, of people who shopped at fewer retailers, uh, than, than they did in the pre-pandemic. 30% uh, downloaded additional apps, um, and 24% uh, and leveraged the uh, in-store and online purchases to complete the, the, the shopping needs that, that they had, just huge numbers and, and super impactful. Yeah, I think we all felt the effects of this. Uh, everyone was kind of nervous to leave home, eager for savings, and purchasing more online than ever before. Um, some of that was out of necessity due to supply chain issues and resulting out of stocks, but many people have continued to stick with these trends, although some things have settled back to a more normal state due to convenience. Um, speaking of, let's take a look at the percentage of shoppers shifting to hybrid or online shopping over the past few years. So you'll see here um, in blue and red, these represent um, people who are completing their regular weekly grocery stock up trips. Um, both in-store and online or online only. So you can see how great those have grown just in the past two years. So in 2019, only 11% of shoppers reported shopping online only or hybrid shopping between in-store and online. So that left 88% of shoppers purchasing their groceries in-store only. And then we can see in 2020, COVID was absolutely a game changer to this. Um, we saw a huge shift when 31% of shoppers reported shopping online at least some of the time. And this year in 2021, 43% of shoppers are now doing at least part of their shopping online, with 15% of those shopping online exclusively. And that's not going away. Um, some studies have predicted that online purchases will account for up to 25% of total grocery sales by 2025. Yeah, so just a huge, uh, a huge change to, to the way that, that people have been shopping after decades of the numbers being predominantly in-store, um, and, and even after 
the mobile being an option, uh, very few people were doing online shopping until COVID hit. You're right, and this channel convergence that includes more online purchase than ever before is significant, but Jason, what specific implications does this have for brands and retailers? Yeah, I'm glad you asked that. You know, from a financial technology perspective, there are, you know, really two areas that are, that are major that we're going to see uh, the market evolve and, and have a real tangible impact on, on all your businesses. Um, so, you know, the first thing is your consumer promotion strategy. And, and so, you know, those of you not familiar with Enmar, you know, we've, we've been in this space for, for 40 years. So it's no surprise that, it, that this is something that we're really dialed into and, and paying attention to. Uh, the second thing is, is your payment strategy. Uh, this is very possibly a newer concept for some of you. And, and it may bring up questions like, what is a payment strategy? And do I need one? You know, how do I create one? And, and we're going to talk about that more as we, uh, as, as we go through the, this presentation here today. All right, let's go. We're going to look at consumer promotions and payments separately and then come together at the end with some key takeaways across both areas. Let's start by taking a look at your promotion strategy. You know, we get a lot of questions uh, from our CPG friends about, you know, the effectiveness of promotions and how do, how, how do we track that and, you know, uh, keeping track of what promotions are successful, what makes them successful, what, what maybe makes them not successful. Um, and if there's ever been a time that promotions are effective, uh, it's, it's right now in, in November of 2021. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Um, in our half one, so we, we've done a first half of 2021 study. We just published that in August, and we're working towards now having the full year 2021 study completed. Um, but in that first half, Shopper Insight study, we found that 78% of shoppers report having either used a digital or paper promotion in the last three months. So what that means is shoppers are actively seeking savings opportunities, and they're increasingly price sensitive. And we've also found that loyalty is waning as shifting between brands or products has become a necessity, as we mentioned before, sometimes due to those out of stocks and supply chain issues. So along with inflation, uh, you know, supply chain issues are buzzwords that we've all heard recently, uh, so much so that the term supply chain issues has become a household phrase. Um, even my 16-year-old daughter knows this term and how it relates to the current issues we're facing, like why does it cost so much to fill up my gas tank, Mom? Um, so, you know, a year and a half after we first experienced this, we're once again facing those out of stocks. And the first time it was more so due to panic buying and the inability for brands to keep up, and this time it's due to more widespread supply chain issues. Um, and that is causing price increases. So, you know, how, as we think about that, how long can shoppers tolerate those increases? How is it impacting our industry? Jason, let's take a look at these stats. Yeah, so, you know, you can see there on the slide some pretty, pretty significant numbers. You know, 80% of consumers purchased a different brand than they normally would in Q3 of this year uh, out of stock and price were the cause 65% uh, of the time. So, you know, just loyalty is running, is running low. And, and then and you can see there, you know, 44% of those folks said that they would repurchase the new brand even when the original came, came back. Um, and most predictions say that the supply issues that are, that are, that, that are driving this are just going to continue uh, in the next year. I don't think anybody at this point disagrees uh, with that, you know, and, and it's impacting everything. You know, Thanksgiving's coming up, and I, I read a, an article that was about, you know, it's going to be the most expensive Thanksgiving ever because of these inflationary and, and supply chain issues. So, you know, Thanksgiving may be a little different in my house. Maybe we'll just everybody have to share a turkey leg, at the, <laughs> you know, or something like that. All right, it's almost lunchtime, so let's keep things rolling. But, you know, as the, uh, as the economy and, and the shopping landscape continue to, to change, um, you know, you've got to really think about how are you evolving your promotion strategy. Uh, the, you know, the old rinse and repeat is, is, is not going to be an option for you for long. Yeah, that's totally right. You know, running promotions comes with some unknowns anyways, um, and we've listed some examples here. You know, what offer methods are best for me? How do I allocate my budget between methods? What should the value of my offer be? So as we think about these questions and others, you know, if you're a brand that's experiencing heavy out-of-stock issues, how does this impact that promotion strategy? You know, do you change your face value? Do you run promotions at all? Um, you know, 
if you're an emerging brand and experience strong growth due to brand switchers, what are you doing to hold on to those shoppers once their legacy items are back on the shelf? Um, and so it's important to work with a promotions partner who understands how to help answer these key questions um, and stay up to date with category and industry trends. You can see over here on the right, you know, these are other questions that, you know, even in a pre-COVID world, you should be thinking about, but are you working with a partner who can help answer these questions, you know? What's happening within my category? Uh, what is that product price point? How is that changing uh, due to supply issues? Um, what does your promotion budget look like? Um, what are your brand goals and what are you doing and embedding in your strategy to meet those goals? Um, so to recap a couple of key takeaways when we think about a promotion strategy, one, consumers are actively seeking promotions. Now is not the time to pull back unless you're experiencing out of stock issues. And two, uh, promotions can lead to new shoppers trying your brand or bringing last buyers back into the fold. Um, additional research shows that those shoppers who have switched to a new brand are willing to stick with that new brand if the value and quality is there. Okay, so we're going to shift gears a little bit and, and, and talk about your uh, uh, all of this, these changes and how that can impact your, your payment strategy and, and get into that section of things. So, you know, Carrie, you know, first off, let's let's define uh, a payment strategy. Can you can you tell everybody what we mean when we say that? Absolutely. At its core, a payment strategy is just about how you use technology to create value for your customers who are making and receiving payments. Um, so we've just got a very basic definition here. Um, it's the intentional use, and I think that word's so important because this is you know tying back to that strategy. How are you using these payments as a part of your strategy? You know, when we think bigger and more broadly, your payment strategy can be and should be holistic. Um, it can inform and help drive shopper engagement and finance strategies for your organization. Yeah, so in essence, this would mean that brands and retailers alike should broaden their, their view of payments and think of them not as a transaction, but as just another engagement touch point along the shopper journey. Exactly. And if you're wondering, do I need to have a payment strategy? The answer is a resounding yes, whether you're a brand or a retailer. Let's take a look at some data to support this. Yeah, so it's, it's estimated that more than half of the world's population will be using mobile wallets uh, by 2025. That's only three years from now. Yeah, and, and it, you know, it may seem hard to believe, but the user experience uh, around mobile wallets, the capabilities that they provide, the integration requirements to accept mo mobile payments um, are worth paying attention to now. Uh, you know, for instance, 18% of Americans uh, are already using alternative payment methods like mobile wallets, and 68% uh, say that they're using them more than a year ago. So what that means is that adoption is still somewhat fresh, and it's not too late to get in with these early adopters. Um, we also see that cash and check are the quickest declining payment methods, according to McKinsey. So it's important to be thinking with a digital first mindset, whether your transactions are occurring at physical point of sale or online. Yeah, so thinking about that, let's dive into some specific areas of opportunity uh, as the way that they relate to payment acceptance. Yeah, uh, Carrie, yeah, and clearly Jason, we just, Jason, yeah, Jason, we just had a question come in here, a relevant question. Uh, are shoppers okay. more price sensitive in store compared to online? That's a great question. I know that price sensitivity is strong online because of the easy nature of just doing a Google search and being able to see at a glance, you know, what are the prices across the board. Um, but we'd love to take that back to our insights team and come back to you with a more buttoned up response. But thank you. That's a really good question. Is that the only question, right? Yeah, that's the only okay. question right now. Thank you. Yeah, so, um, you know, clearly things are changing. The market's evolving. Uh, we've got another kind of statistic-heavy uh, slide here uh, with some really powerful uh, numbers. We've, we've identified three areas of opportunity where technology will matter when it comes to your loyalty goals. First, this is going to sound very familiar after we just went through the promotions piece, but omnichannel shoppers are the new normal. So investing in a payment technology that enables a fluid customer journey is key, and enabling a unified single shopper view will help you track shoppers across the channels they buy in, regardless if they are loyalty members or not. 
Yeah, you know, and, and second, personalization is just a, a key factor that can be influenced by having a payment strategy. It can be extremely difficult to get to know your shoppers, but especially those non-loyalty shoppers. So investing in a payment tool that can help you do more than payments and can help you track shopper behavior, even as a guest checkout, is, is, a, is a key. And then finally, we know payment options are a key conversion factor when it comes to e-com and in-store purchases. And it's critical for merchants to adopt a payment technology that enables broad payments acceptance, including all of the new wallets and alternate payment options. Okay, that was a lot. So Jason, let's dive deeper into these topics so we can help navigate through the various types of technology. Yeah, so bottom line, if you choose the, the right payment gateway, you can solve against the, those three insights that we just uh, discussed. Uh, before we get into the, to the, to the details here, uh, I think we just need to start to and define what a payment gateway is so that we're all on the same page here. Yeah, absolutely. A payment gateway is the software that sits on the pin pad and or the e-com platform that enables merchants to accept payments for cashless tenders across one or multiple channels. So let's be very clear, this is not a payment type or a tender type, but it's essentially the middleman that enables shoppers to pay with credit, wallet, or their payment choice. The terminal alone can't do that. Um, and so you'll see here the illustration towards the bottom. Um, the payment gateway sends that transaction along to the payment processor and finally along to the various networks like MasterCard, Visa. Yeah, so what's really important here is that there, there's this omni-channel opportunity that's presented to us. The key is when you select your payment gateway, you select a gateway that allows you to accept payments physically and digitally and enables a, a single customer view across both channels. Uh, so selecting a gateway with unified tokenization is the key here uh, to tracking shopper behavior in, in a more effective way. So this may be unfamiliar terminology for some folks, so let's be very clear. Tokenization is mainly used for security and compliance to protect your shopper's data. Think of it as a unique code that represents you without disclosing all of the sensitive information about you. And the key benefits of this tokenization is um, targetable audience expansion, enhanced consumer profiling, optimized targeting, and unified commerce, meaning it can help improve the returns process. The additional benefit you get from this is that you can track history against that payment token and will be able to connect the history to a shopper's email address or phone number as soon as you get their permission or opt-in. Um, so think about things like an email receipt, um, you know, in store, in store when the shopper asks for an email receipt, there's an automatic opt-in for marketing communications. Um, other tactics would be opt-in marketing communication during an online purchase or a loyalty sign-up. Um, so what this unified tokenization allows for is the opportunity to get to know your unknown shoppers and activate them like never before. And that's exciting. Yeah, that's exactly right. 40% people are more likely to spend more than planned when their shopping experience is personalized. Uh, tokenization and leveraging that technology to understand, engage um, in a personal way to the shopper is, is a key. Uh, it's essential to have a solution that can integrate seamlessly into your customer data platform uh, and even better if it's bundled as part of one solution with the same tech provider. Right, so what a CDP or customer data platform can do is take those token IDs, transaction and basket data, and any PII or personally identifiable information provided by the gateway and make sense of that data. So it's basically just interpreting it. So you need a CDP in order to create a single customer profile and merge all of this data into one singular ID. Once you have that shopper's opt-in, um, to PII, as mentioned before, this would trigger that personalized marketing at a whole new level across any channel and can help you drive better measurement going forward. Let's make this super clear. Your customer data platform can leverage tokenization to make sense of information and tie it all together to create a single customer profile that you can then use to target and advertise against. Yeah, so 70% of shoppers prefer shopping at a merchant that provides their preferred payment method. Offering better checkout options 
increases conversion by more than 35%. We all know at this point that shoppers want contactless payments, if at all possible. So with this in mind, when you're thinking about your payment uh, gateway uh, that will meet your shopper needs, it's, you've got to make sure that contactless payments is, is a big part of that strategy. So the idea is that you just you enable as many types as possible from the very beginning to ensure that your gateway will continue to invest in new payment options as they pop into the market. I mean, how many cryptocurrencies are out there right now? And and they're they're and they're being new cryptos are being created every day, and more and more shoppers want to spend crypto um, when they can. Yeah, and just looking on the right side of this slide here, we've kind of, you know, please rate the significance of the following factors on your typical choice for an online retailer. And you can see here on that top bar, um, dark blue is extremely significant, and then the red is very significant. So we have over 40, over 50% saying, yes, this is either very significant or extremely significant. And that makes so much sense. In a personal use case, if I'm online and I swipe up to purchase something, if I get to the checkout lane and they don't accept Apple Pay or they don't allow me to pay with Venmo, I may just completely leave that site and disregard my purchase and move on to something else. Um, so we hope this was helpful to see how a payment strategy is critical to your business as you try to capture new and existing consumers in personalized ways. So let's close with a line that we would like for you to remember. Your payment strategy is your new consumer engagement strategy. It's fun because it rhymes. This line is not only relevant for consumer to business payments, but also for business to consumer payments. Let's dive into that, Jason. Yeah, so when we say consumer payments, what we're talking about is any payment made by a business to the consumer for you know, a variety of reasons. So rewards, uh, incentives, uh, customer relation, appeasement. Uh, and, and this makes sense in the context of some of the data that we saw earlier about growing adoption of mobile wallets, declining usage of uh, you know, the incumbent payment methods like cash and, and checks. There are a lot of different business functions where consumer payments might be available. They may be delivered to shoppers as an incentive, buy X product and receive a $5 Visa gift card, for example. The same is true for loyalty and rewards. So an area where we see increasing consumer payments is in that consumer care and consumer relations part of the business. You know, what happens if a customer has a negative experience with your product? Historically, we've seen brands make appeasement payments via paper checks or high-value coupons, which are now a slow resolution in the digital age that we're living in. You know, there's a problem here. Um, those also carry fulfillment and postage costs, which can be high, and they're especially susceptible to fraud. So, Jason, let's talk about a more modern version of these types of payments. Yeah, so we're just we're going to go right back to talking about digital wallets again. You know, the, so as digital wallets become more and more widespread and, and adopted, um, and with contactless payments being more and more common, uh, with the pandemic, these are things that are only going to grow. How might the relationship with your customers change if you were able to send them a payment via a convenient channel, like an email? Give them flexibility to use the money you give them on whatever they want, rather than a, a specific product, maybe. Yeah, you can see here what the user experience might look like when adding the payment to their virtual wallet. So on the first screen, you've got, you know, here's the ad or email that I've received to get a digital payment. This is American Express prepaid virtual gift card. Um, second, I'm just going to enter in my card number. And then third, it, you know, it's so seamless and quick. I've entered that card number in, I got the email acceptance, and it's automatically added to my digital wallet. I can then use that gift card at any retailer, whether it's in-store or online. And so you can see how things come full circle back to the conversation we just had about payments acceptance and turning your payment gateway into another brand building touch point. For retailers or brands selling direct to consumer, your payment gateway could easily be configured to accept gift cards and prepaid cards. Um, as shoppers become more and more hybrid in their shopping preferences, enabling these digital experiences whether issuing or accepting payment is going to help you create the seamless journey that shoppers expect. So a final key takeaway that we want to leave with you guys today. Um, first, channel convergence and the hybridization of shopping are here to stay. They're not going away. You know, COVID did shake things up a bit, but some of these patterns that people learned during that time period are going to stick around.
Yeah, and, and the supply chain issues, inflation uh, are, you know, spurring out of stock. It's going to continue to happen. Brand switching, price sensitivity, you know, all of these things have major implications to your uh, promotion strategy. That's right. And on the tails of that, payments are now the new frontier for consumer engagement. Your payment strategy is your new consumer engagement strategy. If you don't remember anything else from this webinar, that's the key phrase we want you to take away. Yeah, so, you know, we just want to thank everybody for their time today. We tried to time this out so we had plenty of time for, for any questions that may, uh, that may come in. And so um, it looks like we've probably got you know, maybe 15 minutes or something like that. So, so any questions that, 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 that have come in? Uh, Sure, we've got to, some we've got some questions, uh, Jason, and, and folks can uh, ask questions on the chat uh, box, which one just came in right now. Uh, similar to what was mentioned around decreased brand loyalty, are we also seeing increased shifting in retailers' decreased loyalty to specific retailers? We have seen some of that decrease, yes. Yeah, uh, yeah. One of the slides touched on that just a little bit. There was the the, the uh, one of the things we pointed out was with, with downloading multiple apps for uh, you know, and what, so what that what that was is downloading multiple retailer apps so that they could do so that the shoppers could you know shop at multiple uh, retailers wherever they lived. And that's a good point because when we think about the online capabilities, some of that decreased the loyalty is maybe not even going to two grocery stores around your house, but I'm shopping at this retailer and also shopping online. So my loyalty may have previously been directly with that grocery store. Um, so that's one way to think about it. But Jason brings up a good point as well, because we do see more loyalty to a specific retailer for retailers who have those loyalty programs and make it really easy for their customers to get dialed in, see what savings they have going on that week, um, offer digital rewards, um, whether those be coupons, payments, rebates, um, things of that nature. So anything that the retailers are doing to obviously add to that loyalty program, that is keeping shoppers more loyal when they are plugging into those loyalty programs. Okay. Uh, you said that eight of 10 shoppers switch brands in Q3 of 2021. Does your research uh, indicate whether some of those new brands were private label? That's, I'll have to take that back. I'll have to take that question back. Yeah, that's a great, that, that's a, that is a great question. Um, but yeah, we're going to have to. Um, I, I don't. I don't know the answer to that either. We have seen okay. increase on private label, and obviously one of the key factors there being around cost. Okay, excellent. Uh, can companies afford to give promotions right now? I I think they can't afford not to. Um, and that's, you know, kind of one of the things that we're trying to drive home. Shoppers are so sensitive to price right now because of inflation, because of supply chain issues. Obviously, this will not be across the board for all brands. You know, if you're one of those brands who does have a lot of out of stocks and you're dealing with those issues and can't keep your products on the shelf, absolutely, you should not be running promotions. But, you know, with this brand switching going back and forth, how are you keeping those shoppers in your fold? How are you getting them to come back if they've switched over? Or if you're a new brand in the market, how are you incenting them to trial? Okay, uh, next question. Uh, when you talk about wallet provisioning, what about people who don't have smartphones? That's a great question. We do have um, insights that show over 85% of adults in the U.S. do have uh, a smartphone now, so that's certainly a high number, but you know, still 15% of people, we can't just ignore those. And there are still other tactics that you can think about. You know, paper coupons are still being used, um, and then paper checks, still a payment method. Uh, but I think, you know, within those, this, for a retailer, having those loyalty programs where I can see what you have going on, even from a trade perspective, week to week, is going to help with that. Okay. Uh, next question, when and why would I need to issue a payment directly to a consumer? Yeah, those were some of those areas we discussed around appeasement or, you know, if there's a complaint, if something went wrong, 
Or you may want to, you know, on the flip side, just do surprise and delight your customer. You know, thank you for being loyal to my brand. Thank you for continuing to come back, especially when we think about targeting, you know, how are you keeping those happy shoppers happy? Excellent. Okay. Uh, next question. Do we need to think about as cheatment associated with issuing payments to consumers? As cheatment, that's a word that you don't hear every day. Mm -hmm. So as cheatment is closing out. If you've issued a paper check, um, which you know certainly has been more broadly used payment type in the past, as cheatment was something you had to consider to close that out. If that check has never cleared the bank, you've got to go back with the state and clear it out. So with paper checks, yes, that would still be something to consider. But on the flip side, with digital, that's not something that you have to consider any longer. There are fees and certainly time associated with that. So with these digital payout methods, like a rebate or um, a direct payment through a virtual prepaid card, um, achievement is no longer something that needs to be considered. Kind of Excellent. Okay, well, let's go on digital. Uh, Jason, go ahead. Okay, well, oh, yeah, that no. was uh, – Jason, did you, have, did you have something to add to that? No, no, I, not, I think I think Carrie nailed it there. Okay, excellent. Well, that's all the questions that have come in. Uh, I want to thank uh, Jason, you, and Carrie. That was a very fine presentation. I certainly learned a lot. Uh, I did not know um, much about this topic, but I do know a lot now. So thank you very much. So, thank you so uh, much for the opportunity to share with you guys. Oh, it's our pleasure for having you. And uh, if folks have any more questions and want to follow up with uh, Kerry and Jason, you can see on the screen their contact information, their emails is on the screen right there, so you can do that. Thank you again, both of you. It was just a terrific presentation. Thank you. Everyone have a great day.